welcome to the Breaking Educational Barriers Conference here in London, hosted by KICC in conjunction with Oxford University. Proverbs 19.2 says, It is not good for a soul to be without knowledge. And this conference hopes to help with that as it aims to provide information that will dispel the myth surrounding admissions into some of the UK's top universities among students from ethnic minority background. We hope the information provided here today will inspire, challenge and prepare parents and students alike to break the educational barriers. Let us now join Pastor Matthew Ashimolowo with a host of panels and students in discussion. And I think that a lot of people should really take note. I think Pastor has done us really, really a great favour and we are very, very grateful about this. I was, I was here, I was just sending information to people. I said it's, it's just an opportunity, you know, that you can't miss. So, thanks to Pastor Matthew um, and all the team that has put this wonderful work together. It's been fantastic. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And what a fantastic opening. I almost didn't recognize myself for a minute. <laughs> it was that impressive, but I guess if the cap fits, then I'll definitely wear it. Before I begin, can we please give KICC and the University of Oxford a huge round of applause for taking the initiative. for taking the initiative to put on such a fantastic event today. So, following on from that glorious introduction, let me tell you a bit about who I really am. It's true, I'm a journalist, that's what I studied. I've always worked hard, so much so that shortly after graduating, I managed to obtain my dream job at the time, which was working as an entertainment journalist. I was thrown in at the deep end from my first day at work, but because my employer saw me as someone who was focused, dedicated, and eager to learn, I was given some very life-changing assignments. I found myself interviewing some of the world's biggest stars. You might have heard of a few of them. Kanye West, Mariah Carey, some dude named Will Smith. Anybody heard of him? <laughs> Denzel Washington, Usher, the late Aaliyah, Alicia Keys, and more. I was even accosted by Mike Tyson on one occasion. <laughs> but that's a story for another time. I traveled across the world, often first class, to several islands in the Caribbean, Miami, New York, Europe, and South Africa. Simply put, I was living the life. I love what I did then, and I still dabble in this from time to time. But I'm going to let you into a bit of a revelation today. And when I say this, I really mean it. These days, the people I interview are just as worthy, if not more, of the adoration and praise given to these celebrities. I'm talking about the young people who feature in Future Leaders magazine each year. They are true stars. The publication, which celebrates 100 of the most outstanding black graduates in the country, was born nearly four years ago. Out of the need to present some visible role models for black kids in this country, outside of the usual suspects of rappers and sports stars. The individuals profiled in Future Leaders are not much older than a lot of you here. They look like you and come from similar backgrounds, which has proven time and time again the most effective way to showcase role models. They have managed to excel in their studies as well as doing some amazing extracurricular activities, such as setting up schemes to mentor younger kids, undertaking medical missions in developing countries, launching innovative and successful businesses which allow them to pay their way through university. 
and doing all this while achieving a minimum of a 2-1 degree. Some, had, some have even taken on a rigorous training schedule in preparation for the 2012 Olympics while studying, as was in the case of 400 metres hurdling star Perry Shake Strayton, who features in the magazine this year. As I said before, none of these people were born with a silver spoon in their mouths, have two heads, or a magic wand. They're from council estates, very modest backgrounds, and many have grown up in single parent homes. And in a lot of cases, they are the first ones in their family to go to university. Edwin Bronny Mensah, who was our number one future leader in 2010, grew up in Edmonton. He attended Manchester University, one of the best in the country, and obtained a first class degree. He went on to do his masters and PhD all by the age of 24. But that's not all. He managed to do this while running a successful social enterprise by the name of Give Me Tap, which raises money to provide clean drinking water for people in the developing world. Segwa Kiwanuka, who is the number one future leader in this year's magazine, also grew up in modest surroundings in South London. But again, he worked hard and gained admission to the University of Cambridge. But he certainly didn't rest on his laurels while there. Again, he completed a PhD by the age of 24 in chemical engineering. He has had his work published in leading international journals and was specially selected to attend scholarly programs at some of the world's most prestigious seats of learning, such as the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, better known as MIT, and Harvard. Okay, here's a question for you. How many black students out of 30,000 do you think got three A's or better at A level in 2009, which is the last year for which figures were published? Anyone? <laughs> okay, let me tell you. The number is actually 452. Just 452 out of 30,000 black students. Firstly, I'm sure you will agree that is not good enough. With all the talent we have in our communities, that is not good enough. And secondly, there is absolutely no reason why some of you here, why all of you here who are of that age group can't be in that group at some time. No reason at all because that is what you will need to gain admission to Oxford or Cambridge. So what does it take? There is a focus taken on by these young people I mentioned, and that starts before they've even taken their GCSEs. When they make that decision that they're going to grab this opportunity with both hands and work as diligently as possible to achieve the best results. This is when they realise that excellence is the answer to a lot of things that tend to knock you on your life journey. From racism, prejudice, insecurities, frustration, disappointment and regret. Today, I want all the young people here to make that decision, to be committed to hard work, to not slack or coast, and to not put off doing what you need to do today to prepare for tomorrow. But there is another side to this, and this is where I want all the parents here today to take note. You too need to educate and inform yourself 
so that you can stay on top of your children, encourage them and guide them. They need your support, but the right support. So you need to read up on things and find out everything you need to know to make sure your child is on the right track. You need to know the importance of good A-level grades and how this follows you right through to when you get a job and can be the difference between the kind of job you're eligible for in the future, even if you have a first class degree. Parents and students need to be aware that it is just as important for a young person to have good extracurricular activities on his or her CV. This starts right from A level and should definitely be a big part of your university experience. Employers take this very seriously when selecting candidates. So do ensure you take up mentoring younger students, posts on societies such as the ACS and roles on the board of your student union, as this will help you with the skills you need to compete at the top level, where you will need more than your degree to do this successfully and with longevity. So why are there so few black students at Oxford and Cambridge? There's a variety of reasons, but having spoken to so many young black students about to apply to university, or those already there, some of the things I hear time and time again are, it's too far, it's going to be full of posh people, there are no black people there, where will I buy my black hair products? <laughs> How am I going to rave? But with that attitude, it's not just Oxford and Cambridge you won't get to. You won't get anywhere in life. The truth is, when I speak to black students who are studying at Cambridge or Oxford, and there's quite a few of them that I meet now, some admit they initially had similar thoughts. But what overrode this was their belief that they were worthy of the best. So they pushed these thoughts aside and went for it. And in line with this, they discovered once they were there, they do fit in and they do belong. And why wouldn't they? Now ask yourself, why wouldn't I? There is a saying that I've heard that you don't go to university, the university goes through you. If you attend Oxford or Cambridge, not only do you come out with one of the best degrees in the world, you emerge knowing the leaders of tomorrow and with a mindset and confidence which provides you with a fantastic chance of being one of them yourself. This is why this initiative is so important. We heard about this great um, opportunity and what we've done is we've come down today to see what it's all about. Um, what will you take away with you today from this conference? Mindset. My mindset has changed. It has changed so much. I am amazed of the information that we've received today. And it's inspired me to work really hard in school to get up to that level of education. Fantastic. And have you been inspired as well? Yeah, like I've been really inspired. Like I learned that there's no limits like to what I can do. I think it was a brilliant conference and a great opportunity for young people to come and just know how to um, increase their potential and just know that there's a way and they can do it. I think it's very good and it's informative because some things that I didn't really consider when applying for university, they've spoken about it now and for people that are applying for university or like for young people, even in early days of secondary school, it would help them a lot just to find an easier route to take to go to university. So what we want to talk about is why would anyone want to go to Oxbridge, this mythical Harry Potter land? What is it about it that makes it somewhere that both Catherine and I fell in love with as, as young girls? 
Why have so few black students been attending Oxford and Cambridge in the past couple of years? What is the admissions process like? It is different to other places. It is a bit complicated. It is annoying, um, but it's worth it in the end. So what are the practical steps you have to take? And finally, what can we do to help you and what can you do to help yourselves achieve that goal if that's what you decide is the right thing for you? We're rated regularly in the top couple of universities in the world. You already heard about MIT, Caltech, Harvard, Imperial. These American giants with money coming out of their areas and very big specialisms are up there. Fourth and sixth in the world at the moment, among those four, are Oxford and Cambridge. So not only are they the best in the UK, they are up there in the top ten in the world. So if you want to aim high, you can't get much higher. And why is it so good? Well, we take the best students, we give them a unique and incredible education, which means they get better even more quickly. So take the best and make them better rapidly, and you've got the super best. Um, and this is just an incredible package to be a part of. Um, you never know who you're going to be sitting next to at, at lunch. And I found a real humility about Oxford, because everyone's brilliant. And everyone knows they're brilliant, but they also know that you're brilliant, and you're probably the specialist in your area, so they better jolly well not assume they know anything. <laughs> and there's this wonderful mix of excitement, brilliance, and humility, all bound up together, that is extraordinarily powerful. We've got to build that, we've got a unique collegiate structure where not only are you in a university, but you're in a mini university within your college, and that's become a real family. I've been at Merton for four months now, and I feel completely settled, and they are absolutely incredible, and I'm having the time of my life. At that point, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Catherine to tell you a bit more about her take on the place. So good morning and thank you very much. Um, my job um, usually keeps me pretty much rooted in Merton. I'm responsible for running its academic activities. So it's a real treat for me to, to get out and I'm extremely grateful to KICC for the opportunity to be part of this conference. So while for me it's a fabulous chance to, to get into London and to meet you here, um, one slight regret that I've got is that I can't bring you to Oxford right now to show you it. And as some of these images, um, I think, convey, it really is a stunningly beautiful place. It even looked good at half past six this morning when I was driving out of it. I think that's a real test. But there, there was the sun breaking through and a, and a light mist. So it's, it's a very beautiful, venerable city. Um, it's got all manner of um, resources which our students are able to access. So um, that top picture of the, the dome-shaped building. That's the, the Radcliffe camera. It's at one of the, the reading rooms in the Bodleian Library. And that's a library where every book published in Britain has to be deposited, um, which is fantastic in terms of building up a collection. It's a bit of a nightmare, though, for the librarians. They have to find three miles of new shelves every year. But that's the, the, the wealth of holdings that they've got with books. I think perhaps I'll buy them a Kindle for Christmas and they could <laughs> shrink down a little. Um, so it's a place, I think, that's been a magnet for talented people you know, for, for centuries. And you, you sort of feel the, the ghosts and you, and you meet the current um, uh, famous people as you move around the, the city. And just my own college um, of Merton, you know, amongst people who've um, loomed large is the, the person who gave his name to the Bodleian Library, Sir Thomas Bodley in the past. Um, we've got a good track record on, on writers, people like um, J.R. Tolkien, who you might have heard of, the Lord of the Rings author, was um, a professor at Merton. And at the moment, we've got probably the most distinguished mathematician in the world who is a fellow of the college, Sir Andrew Wiles. And he's the person who solved Fermat's last theorem. It had been unsolved for a very long time, and it was a Merton man who cracked it. Um, it's a quirky place, and I think that's part of its charm. We've got some bizarre rituals. You know, we don't take exams in our normal clothes. We dress up in black and white, and we look smart. And I think these traditions can sometimes look a little odd from the outside, but it's extraordinary how much people enjoy them um, when they're, they're part of it. So it's a place that has a long history. It, it looks back to the past, but it's also very vital. And I was just thinking about some of the stories which caught my ear listening to the radio and the news this week and you know one of them is the potential that aspirin might have 
to prevent cancer, you know, research done in Oxford. You know, so many of the news stories that I hear in the morning when I'm getting ready and eating my breakfast, when I get into work and I look at the university's little internal report on, you know, what's gone out into the media, they're stories that originated in Oxford, so it's still immensely relevant. So, um, click on. So um, I think Adenike has already you know, raised one of the key questions. If it's such a fantastic place, why are there so few black students there? And I mean, obviously, we could talk all day about this topic, but I think there are three points that uh, in our minds. I mean, one is that people aren't applying. And obviously, it's difficult to admit people if they don't go through the process. Um, and I think that the, the list of, of myths which Adenike uh, went through are absolutely fascinating. And I think you know, one of the things that we can definitely try to do today is to bust some of those myths. Um, she's also given you, you know, the figures on um, the kind of academic threshold that we have, and you know, that's a, a reality. So I think a, another thing that we want to achieve today is to just encourage you to raise your aspirations so that you are getting the grades that you need to be credible applicants. And I think there's another really important theme that we'll be exploring in one of the workshops this afternoon, and that's about the subject choices that you make. Because it is a, a fact that there are preponderantly more black applicants who are going for the really competitive subjects, which is limiting your chances. Um, you know, so subjects like maths and medicine and economics and management got a lot of black students applying for them, but the, you know, the, the ratios of competition there are extremely high. And they're not the only way to get into the sorts of professions that those subjects might lead on to. So I think that's a really interesting theme that we can delve into in more detail in the course of the day. We're going to move on now just to look at the, the technicalities of the application process. I hope we've persuaded you that uh, thinking about Oxbridge is a good idea and that the degree would confer a certain value. So, um, as Cressida said, it's not a straight run home to <laughs> make an application to Oxford. I mean, one thing that we encourage everybody to do is to think really carefully about the course that they're choosing. And I think that's the primary um, decision that you make. That's the thing that it's most important to get right. Um, and then think about your college choice. And then you've got to be off your marks a bit earlier than the other um, pupils in your school, because everything for Oxford and Cambridge has to be submitted to UCAS by the 15th of October. Um, Cambridge has got a couple of extra elements in its application process. In addition to the information that they get from the UCAS form, they also have um, a special questionnaire which they ask students to complete online. That's not something which, which Oxford requires. So having got the form in, in the standard way, through the UCAS application service. There are some extra hoops which some of the subjects at Oxford asks you to jump through. We sometimes ask for samples of written work, of essays that you've produced at school for certain subjects, so that our tutors can make an assessment of your writing ability. And we also, across, I think, most subjects now, 80% of applicants, I think, will be involved in an aptitude test of one kind or another. In the past, we used to have something called the Oxbridge Entrance Exam, and, and that, we stepped away from that, and we managed without tests for a while. But we have a, a real challenge, which is many, many, many more people get top grades at A-level than we could possibly admit. So we need to sift to find the real cream. And, and one of the tools that we use are uh, aptitude tests, which are not designed to test what people know, but to test their potential for the subject that they've, they've chosen. We're also, I think, relatively unusual in requiring um, our shortlist of candidates to come to interview so we get a chance to meet them face to face. And I think that can be one of the things which deters people from an Oxford application, because it's not always something that's been part of your experience as a 17-year-old. Um, but in fact, although we use the term interview, it can be a little bit misleading. What we're trying to do there is to synthesize or model or mock up the kind of education that we offer because it's an education that has small group contact so if we meet you in that kind of context we can see whether you're the sort of person who will respond to that and get the hang of it and get the value out of it. Um, one thing that's quite humane is that you do hear the outcome from this long process whether it's a yes or whether it's a no reasonably quickly um, and then it's not the only 
um, choice that you make. People will have um, an insurance offer as well and they will know usually how they stand by August when the exam results come out ready to start in October in Oxford's case. So this flow here is the one that's prevalent at the minute. I can see there are some quite young faces in the audience and it could be that there's been a change to this process by the time you get as far as applying and you have to watch this spot because the, the um, university application service is currently consulting on some possible changes to the timeline but we don't know quite what they will, will be at the moment. So um, let's talk about what we're looking for. And I guess it boils down to, to three things. Are you up to the mark academically? And as we said, it's quite a high threshold that we, we set. Second thing is, is there a course that makes your eyes dance and twinkle and you could, allows you to convey a passion and an enthusiasm for that subject? That's really important because we don't offer all the sorts of courses that universities do. And it could be a very good reason that we don't have an offering that, that suits you, that might mean you're better suited to an application somewhere else. But if what we're offering is the kind of thing that you know, gets you going, then um, definitely worth considering it. And will you enjoy being challenged and tested and stretched? Because it's not necessarily a, a really comfortable education. We want our students to work hard. So they're the things that we're, we're looking for. And all in all, it boils down to a quest for academic potential. And that sounds great, really straightforward. But let's just break that down into constituent elements. What are the tutors actually looking for when they assess their applications? Well, if you were them, you'd look at what's this person done in the past, wouldn't you? You'd look at the track record. You'd look at what sorts of GCSEs, what sorts of AS levels they'd achieved. One of the things that's really clever about the Oxford system is it's perfectly incentivised. The people who make the selection decisions have to teach the people that they admit for the next three or four years. It's really in their interests to get the decision right. And th they're going to want to take the bright cookies. They're going to want to take the people who really care about biological sciences, about English literature, or whatever the subject is, because they're going to be the most fun to teach. So that enthusiasm is really important. We're also looking for excellence. Um, the, the kind of motto of, of my college, Merton, is sustaining excellence. And we're reflecting at the minute on the fact that we've been doing that for nearly 750 years. It's an exhausting business. <laughs> but we're looking for people who want to sustain that excellence, people who want to drive themselves. You know, the, it's the equivalent, really, of you know, wanting to represent your country. We want that kind of hunger. And we're also looking for an independent cast of mind. I and mean, I've mentioned the fact that many more people get the top grades at A-levels than we can admit. And there are people who are able to do very well on the sort of school exams who don't necessarily have the independent, adventurous, initiative-taking sort of spirit that we're looking for. So we want people who are not just good at being taught, but people who are good at learning and good at exploring new problems for themselves. I sometimes feel a bit like the CIA during the um, admissions process because we're building up really comprehensive dossiers of information about every applicant. It's a hugely time-consuming business and it's something which the, uh, my academic colleagues take incredibly seriously. I mean, these are world-leading academics who are flying to conferences in San Diego and writing papers and publishing books and they take out a huge chunk of time every autumn to assess these, these applications. What year are you now? I'm in my fourth year of um, studying biochemistry. Um, it's my undergraduate degree so, and I'll graduate with a master's in biochemistry. What's life like in Oxford for a student, if you will excuse me, from an ethnic minority background, what are your experiences? Um, so as a student it is um, something different. As I said I grew up in London and um, in my secondary school there were many ethnic minorities. Um, however in my sick, sick form there was only, I was one of very few people. So coming to Oxford it was a bit similar to that but um, even more diverse in that people are from all over the UK. But I find that everyone's very open minded and um, I think I also had to be open-minded and assume people would not judge me for who I am. We came in there thinking there would be a, a scholarship, but based on the way it's been structured, you don't actually need a scholarship for it. The, the, the finance is well structured and anyone can do it. So yeah, it's all fine, but Cambridge, I think that's yeah, what you want. I'm going for Cambridge. Um, I thought it was really good because I wanted to go to Cambridge anyway, so this kind of really helped me to know kind of what to do to get there. 
I'm from South East London, uh, so it's always uh, a pleasure to kind of jump over to this side of the river um, and experience uh, London, but kind of a different London um, to one, one which I know. Um, it's also a pleasure to be here at this time. Um, there's a common consensus in Oxford, particularly amongst the scientists and uh, mathematicians and medics um, of the Oxford population, that art students such as myself um, rarely wake up before 2 p.m. Um, on weekdays and tend to hibernate throughout the weekend. So Saturday morning, um, 11 o'clock is, a, I guess, homage to the fact that it's not always quite like that. Anyway, as I said, um, let me tell you a little bit about me and my background. Um, my name is Andrew O'Flaherty. I'm 20 years old and I'm in my second year studying history and English. So it's a joint degree at Merton College. Um, I'm originally, as I said, from South East London. Uh, for those of you who know it well, I'm uh, from Upper Nord, so just on the edge of Croydon. Um, I went to Dulwich College, which is an independent school in South East London, um, and was there for 10 years from the age of seven till uh, just 18, just before my 19th birthday. And then I went straight up to Oxford after that, so I didn't do a gap year. Um, it's interesting, my, my parents are from the West Indies. Uh, my dad is from St. Kitts, my mum is from Antigua. Um, and I was talking to her about, obviously, that I'd be giving a small presentation uh, today. And um, she actually grew up in this neighborhood. Um, and she, she came here from Antigua when she was six years old. Um, and one of the things she mentioned to me was she, when she came to England for the first time with her mum, she was, she was around in neighborhoods like this where they had the sign, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. <laughs> and as you can imagine, for a young black girl who, and also added to that a heavily Irish name, like a Flaherty, it's always <laughs> a bit of a dodgy one. Um, so not quite ideal. But I guess the reason I emphasize this um, is that for me, I've very much always grown up with a perspective of a mixed identity um, in the sense that my dad was, you know, West Indian, but from quite a middle class family. My mum grew up in Hackney and in one of the poorer areas and shared a bedroom for kind of the first part of her life. Then I go to a good school, but it's in South East London. And the same way, I'm always kind of confident and feel that language is one of my strengths. But at the same time, I'm conspicuously aware of the fact that I'm a black boy from South East London. So there are all these kind of I guess, contradictions and seeming conflicts, perhaps, that I've grown up with um, in terms of Oxford. And, and I suppose the way in which, now in hindsight, I reflect that Oxford uh, relates to this and where it fits in to this, my kind of quite unique upbringing, is in the sense that it's very much just another part in this compendium of various identities um, and various new wacky kind of things that make me who I am. And I suppose it's in this context and in the context of your own diverse and seemingly contradictory sometimes perhaps, and yet therefore unique backgrounds, which I would recommend very strongly Oxford as an aspiration, which all of you should hopefully have. Um, growing up, um, I've always been fortunate enough uh, not to have suffered any kind of strong racial uh, discrimination or racism. Um, there was one occasion Actually, just before I was leaving Dulwich, um, I guess you all have it, the kind of situations where you're all sitting in the classroom before a teacher comes in, you're all kind of messing around. So at Dulwich, I had this, um, and it was after I got my offer. And we were having a discussion, got onto race, I'm not sure exactly of the context, but one of the boys in the class, white guy, not that it is particularly important, said to me, well, Andrew, you're hardly black. You're going to Oxford and reading history in English. <laughs> and, um, so, yeah, I, I got pretty angry. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm normally quite a uh, conciliatory and civilized individual, but I, in, in so many words, I expressed what I felt was particularly wrong with his statement. Um, at that time, I was upset because he had seemed to suggest that you can't be smart and black, or you can't be down with your culture and go to one of the best academic institutions in the world. Um, bear in mind that was before I went up, so I had, hadn't really had a chance to experience Oxford as a culture. Now, when I reflect on the same statement he made, I 
actually have a sense of frustration. I don't know if any of uh, um, the guys who've spoken before will, will share in this frustration that Oxford is often seen as an environment in which you have to be of a certain type. You have to fit a certain stereotype or live up to some, some sense of something that maybe we in the black community might not have. Um, there is that. You, you guys have seen the pictures, and I don't know how many of you have been to Oxford before. Um, it is a wacky kind of castle place. Um, one of my other best friends is a Lithuanian white guy, and um, he actually, he, um, he, you know, is always talking to me, and we talk about loads of subjects. Um, he's far better at basketball than I am. Um, so he kills me in that area, and um, we often talk about things like hip hop. And I mentioned to him that I like the uh, the new Kanye West Jay Z album, Watch the Throne, and he actually always criticised me because of this and says, Andrew, you're too mainstream. You got to listen to more kind of underground stuff like your <laughs> your Jedi mind and Wu Tang and stuff like that. So. So, you know, it is, you know, it is a contrast and a, a diverse community in which we live. Um, so, yeah, uh, my point then, I guess, is while the, whilst one might think that it takes a certain type um, of individual to apply to Oxford, um, and that perhaps your ethnicity might be at odds with this seemingly aloof academic institution, in actuality, it's just like any other university in which we are vibrant, you know, fairly diverse community in which rich and poor, black and white, red and blue are all very welcome. Um, there are also, as, as has been mentioned, a huge number of initiatives to get people like you um, to, to encourage you to apply and give you the confidence to say that actually, if you work for it, you deserve a place there as much as anyone does. Um, of course, there is, you know, a relative absence of uh, students from African uh, Caribbean backgrounds, uh, but f for me, that's all the more reason why it's so important, and I think we within the black community have more of a responsibility to apply to institutions such as Oxford. Um, thus far, for me personally, I've found it to be an incredible experience. Um, certainly, there are extremely talented, there are extremely talented people. Uh, you'll be pushed, and you'll have to work hard. Um, yet in terms of the benefits uh, which such a community will have, be it in terms of employability, uh, unparalleled exposure to people who are preeminent within their fields, um, and even just the confidence that you'll have in approaching kind of life's problems and stuff like that, I think that it is an environment in which you will thrive. Um, finally, uh, and I apologise that I haven't gone into too many specifics about a typical Oxford day, perhaps there isn't really one, um, but I would offer you guys this advice as applicants uh, from, from my own perspective. Aspire towards the subject and those specific areas of your subject that you have a genuine intellectual curiosity for. Um, and within that endeavour, do that you can, do all that you can to stretch beyond your A-level syllabus. You don't know how much, it's, how important it is that you take an initiative and look at areas of those subjects that your teachers haven't necessarily shown you about. Um, above all, be bold uh, and demonstrate that which sets you apart um, and that which makes your ideas and your arguments unique. Um, and then, hopefully, you can also be part of a community which is extremely diverse, um, extremely unique, um, and one that stretches towards ever more diversity. Thank you very much. If you are interested, if you think you would like to be one of those people in Oxford, if you think you can get the three A's or the A's and those stars that we're going to need, and you can look at that as a future goal, then how can you, how can you use us to help you get there? The first and possibly the most important thing is come to Oxford. We've all come down this morning, it's 60 miles away. That's not unmanageable. It's an hour on the train, an hour and a half on the bus. Come and join us, come to an open day, wander around the city and get a feel for it. There will be academics on tap, tutors of all different kinds, students, various people to help. The academic open days this year are the 27th and the 28th of June. 
Booking is opening through both the central office and the colleges from about now onwards. So keep an eye on the website and come and visit us. We're also offering a lot more small scale taster type things. So we generally run taster days for lots of different year groups. That's what my job is for. It's to bring people in and to go out to people and organize these kinds of things. We're gonna put some on specially for KICC and the people here today. So you're gonna have a chance to come on some that are designed just for you. There are bigger university schemes. Talk to your school, talk to someone like me and I can put you directly in touch with things. Find out what we're doing. I've got information about various different schemes um, um, with my helpers here today. There are mailing lists. If there are any teachers in the audience, we've got a specific teacher's mailing list, and my colleagues have got um, information leaflets about that. We're also going to look at organising application workshops and interview workshops, because we can only give you a brief overview today. It's a long process. And it's a process that requires different kinds of intervention at different points. So if you're worried about filling out the form, if you're worried about the personal statement, if you're worried about coming up for interview, then that's something that we can provide at different points through the year. So hopefully there'll be a mailing list from today, etc. And we'll be able to keep in contact and do things as appropriate. As Catherine said, though, it's not about what we can do for you most of the time. It's about what you can do to be those independent learners and do for yourselves to help get you to, to us and help, sh help you shine. You're in London. What a fantastic resource to have on your doorstep. I spend a lot of time in much more rural areas where getting to a library can be hard, let alone to anything exciting. So look at the free papers that come out every day. Metro is a brilliant resource. Pick it up. Look at the listings. What do I fancy doing today? Set yourself a challenge. Once a week, go to a, an interesting thing. Once a month, whatever it is, there's a resource out there. Go to the museums. British Museum, fantastic collection. Everything under the sun you could possibly want there. And all the smaller ones. And London prides itself among major European cities for having free museums. It doesn't charge, unlike most of the rest of Europe. Go to your school or local library. I used to go to my local library and when I was a, a primary school girl and take out the entire myth shelf. Sit at home, read it, take it back, go back and take out the next shelf. As I got older, that progressed to, well, actually, I'm really interested in philosophy. So I'd go to the library and take out the philosophy shelf, go home, read it, find a teacher who'd talk me through some of it afterwards. He then got to lending me his own books so that we could then talk about them afterwards. You've got a huge number of books and resources available to you in London. Kindles are great if you can get hold of anything like that. Um, suck up the knowledge. I've got flyers with me today for what's called iTunes U. The university has the highest downloads for any of these services in the UK um, and has topped some ridiculously huge number. I, it changes every day. Um, millions of downloads. Academics have had lectures recorded. They've done specific podcasts just for students outside Oxford to listen to. It can be as simple as a topic you're interested in or just picking something at random. Um, and they're available through iTunes U. And if you don't have iTunes, they're available on the university's website as a separate podcast. My speech is taken from two books I've written. Uh, the first one is called uh, What's Wrong With Being Black? And uh, a chapter in that book dealt with the challenge of uh, a faulted educational system. Uh, in that chapter, I tried to address the challenge of education in, in the black community in America, Africa, and the United Kingdom. So today I've tried to expunge and remove America and Africa and address Britain uh, in that part of my speech, which is taken from the book. You might hear a little bit of America. Please do endure. Uh, the second part of my speech is taken from another book called uh, 100% Live Improvement, which is a recent book uh, written. In any society, education should be for the enhancement of people, for the development of the individual until they become a source of help and blessing to humanity. Education should prepare a man to be able to serve his community and humanity bringing to, ta to the table his own quota in meeting the economic, social, intellectual, and spiritual needs of his nation and of the world. When a nation's 
leaders set educational policies, it should be with the intention to achieve the mentioned purposes, to develop the individual and the talents he has, and to help all persons become wholesome human beings. Education should challenge the individual person to venture, create, and step into the unknown. After all, it was education that led to the discovery of the various principles in science and physics that helped man to walk on the moon and conquer the elements. A nation, therefore, should, a nation should therefore produce citizens who will be able to achieve this, bring pride to their nation, encourage the coming generation, etc., etc. In almost every country, the central educational system is run by the government. And that is probably why Thomas Jefferson, in a letter to George Washington in 1786, said, it is an axiom of my mind that our liberty can never be safe but in the hands of the people themselves, and that, too, of the people with a certain degree of instruction. In the United Kingdom, Ofsted, the educational watchdog of Britain, has found that the system is failing black boys and girls particularly black boys who are more than four times as likely to be excluded from a classroom as other students. The United Kingdom attempted to introduce a method of selection of certain students to prepare them to do degree courses. However, Ernest Emenyonu, this is a Nigerian writer and thinker, argued that this selection will work against black young people and not bring any net improvement overall to them. In the GCSE exams, where there is a higher tier and a foundation tier, he observed that in certain subjects like mathematics, a good number of black children were excluded from this method. Where gifted pupils were identified, it resulted in black children again being excluded. John McWhorter, an American linguist, indicates that in 1997, for example, 70,000 students applied for admission to American law schools. Among them, only 16 black students were scored 60, who scored 64 or higher were given admission. In another statistic about scholastic ad achievement test, McWhorter indicates that in 1995, only 184 black students in the United States got 700 or the on the verbal portion of the SAT, and 616 black students scored over 700 on the maths portion. The top score in each case was 800. These two were 0.2% and 0.6% respectively of the black test takers. The average score for all those taking the SAT is 1,540. So the society who produced great people like uh, Naila Fitzberg is also plagued with the challenge of underperformance by young people from the black community in the United States. Some may want to blame the restriction put on black people in the days of slavery when they were prohibited from education in many of the states. Um, you needed to read the book, What's Wrong With Being Black. You'd be shocked that some states will actually prosecute anyone who educated a black person in the days of slavery. Reasons for black educational crisis. In the United Kingdom, Mylena Boyum, last chairperson of the National Assist Assembly of Against Racism, is among the black leaders who maintain that institutional racism is the real problem. White teachers do not understand the culture of black young people. We must take into account that black settlement in the United Kingdom is really no more than 55 years. While blacks have been associated with the United Kingdom upward of 300 years, there has not been an actual settlement in a large proportion until 1948 when the United Kingdom campaigned in the Caribbean for, for blue-collar workers, no black-collar people, for blue-collar workers to come and uh, fill the employment gap. The Commission for Racial Equality also warned that along with institutional racism, there was peer pressure. Young blacks who pressure fellow blacks not to pursue educational achievement. 
apart from black people's exposure to reading in antiquity, which was later lost as they found themselves uh, in the challenging parts of Africa, the people who's, who most exposed to education would be blacks who were taken as slaves to the United States of America. When finally blacks were opportune to read, the generation who knew slavery made efforts to see that the next generation were educated. And in the last couple of decades, though there has been an evolution of a new generation who, although they have ripped the, the progress and achievement that the civil rights movement made, has negated advances by their apparent anti-intellectual stance. What, ac what accounts for a low achievement of blacks in education? McWhorter, whom I quoted earlier, argues that the chief cause is not racism, as seen or claimed by several people, and those whom he, but those whom he calls victimologists. Neither is it inadequate school funding or class status or parental educational level, which in a sense is buttressed by the fact that in a place like Africa, where there is a strong desire to educate in order to escape the poverty trap. Uh, you need to read uh, the book, What's Wrong With Being Black? Because again, the, the, the pendulum is tilted too far in Africa. Everyone wants to get educated to escape poverty, not to really change society. Parents never use their class or poverty as an excuse not to educate in Africa, but rather as a reason to educate their children so the next generation will be better off than the previous. McWhorter, ag McWhorter's argument rests on one major point, anti-intellectualism, a plague which he feels is tearing and pulling down the black community. Anti-intellectualism, in the opinion of McWhorter, began as a legacy of the 60s when in order for the civil rights movements and, mo uh, and most others were to make uh, progress, they presented an anti-intellectual approach. To make sense of life seemed to come up with an attitude of making all things illegitimate, which have an appearance of whiteness. The second argument which he makes is that black parents demand less of their children in school than whites and Asians. Many, Asians. many Asian students do well, possibly in, in his own opinion, because the parents may have to run two or three shops to get money. McWhorter feels that the devaluation of education is local to black American culture or black culture in, in, in the whole. His observation is drawn from the fact, and this is in America, that black Africans and Caribbeans who migrate to the United States of America do well. So it is not the system. It is the persons who have chosen to devalue education. Joel Squartz, drawing from the works of John Ogu, another Nigerian-born anthropologist who works at the University of California in Berkeley, also seems to buttress the same points made by McWhorter, although from a slightly different perspective. Ogu, the Nigerian, argues that African American students do poorly in school in part because they don't apply themselves. There will be students out there watching and saying, oh, he goes to Oxford, how did you get there? Um, I literally just kind of thought, why not? Like, I had five options for UCAS and I was like, it's a good university. I had the grades to, uh, I had four A's at AES level. And I was like, what's the worst that can happen if I put in an application? I went to have a look at the open day, really liked it. It was kind of, it was a bit different to everybody else that I'd visited, but the people there were really welcoming, quite, quite forward and approachable. And I was like, yeah, I could see myself here. It's a really good university, why, why don't I put it down? So that's kind of where it came from. It, was, it wasn't advice or anything. Brilliant, so you basically took a chance you went for it and you're there. Yeah, it's like I got, I got a bit of help from a few teachers and stuff. I think it'd be unfair for me not to say that. Um, and my parents were useful and helpful as well in that sense. But it was, it was, it was a weird experience, but it's, it's something that I'd encourage loads of people to go for. I mean, what's the worst that can happen, essentially? You, you'd never know, and that, I think that's much worse than knowing. Fantastic. So basically you are saying it is achievable, it is possible. Yeah. And you're there. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, it's totally different. 
We hope you have been inspired and challenged by this program as you begin to review your investment in your children's education. Do not let this be another television program. We encourage you to take active and constructive steps towards breaking the status quo. If you need any more information about today's program, please contact KICC. Thank you and God bless.